Do you think the censorship of Trump is working to actually have people talk about it less? Um, yeah. Talk about seems, Trump it, less? Talk about Trump less. I think, yeah, I Trump, think it is kind of working. And, and I, I think Trump chose to kind of back off for a, for a couple months. Mm. That's the scary thing about censorship is it does work. It can work in an isolated system. So within the mainstream media network, the big tech social media network, I mean, yeah, you can stamp it out of those, but then, you know, it it still has a life outside of there, but it, it can be hidden. I don't think censorship works. It's, it's not true. Donald Trump just wasn't doing anything for a few months. He was just playing golf. Then he started sending out emails again, and then all of a sudden they kept talking about it again. And even when Trump wasn't saying things, they were still talking about Trump nonstop. They were impeaching the guy. Mm. They are the ones who don't want him to let him go. Now Trump launched from the desk of Donald Trump, and then people have created social media accounts that are just reposting what Trump is posting on his own site, and Twitter's banning them all. Yeah. Probably because we're in a less isolated environment now with the internet. Because like the Romans, when they conquered the Gauls, this guy Vercingetorix, like they, they just basically stamped out all record of those people. They, let, they, they censored it away, and Tartaria and all this ancient Asian cultures that are just, we don't even know what they are because they were erased. Let's, 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 let's clarify something real quick. When people say that censorship works and you look at how it affects modern political discourse, it works in the sense that you hide certain things, but it doesn't make them go away. So it has the, 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 the tensions between the culture war, uh, has it stopped? No, it's gotten substantially worse. But they banned all of these right-wing individuals and these conservatives and these Trump supporters. Yeah, well, they still exist and they still believe things. What happened was these journalists are sitting on Twitter, rocking back and forth, like scratching their head until their skin, until they're bleeding. And then finally, Twitter says, we banned those people. And they go, they're gone. Hmm. They're finally gone. And they're just literally still sitting there. It's just all Twitter did was like pull down the blinds. Right. They're literally still there. No, you can feel the cultural tension building up because of all this stuff. So it's the, the pressure cooker is pressure cookers on max. Yeah. That's me worried, man. That's why I was like, that's why when you were talking about lifeboats, I thought about the, the gun and Crowder. Yeah. The, the key is, I think when you look at this Nietzsche quote and you really let it seep into you, if you stare at the problem all day, it will, you will become part of the problem. You have to, to not, I mean, it's good to know what the problem is, but you got to find a solution. I don't. Uh, I don't think it means you will become. It says be careful that you you, you that don't. You don't. Right. Some great it people might. can probably stare into it their entire life and not become the demon. But I think there is a tendency to. So you know, this Alaska airline thing really unsettled me because it reminded me not of 1984, which is technically fiction, but of actual historical events like during the Soviet Union. Uh, those nice people who just silently sat by while their neighbors were rounded up. They didn't want to think about politics. They just wanted to go about their day and then they would turn in their own neighbors. This is what Gina Carano got in trouble for. She was right. I just heard um, a number that said that in the Soviet Union, two in five people were informants for the state. Yes. That meant that somebody in your family was an informant and you couldn't talk about anything. So you're going to talk about censorship working get people in your family involved on the government payroll. You see, you know why they had to round people up and send them to gulags, Ian? Because the censorship wasn't working. Mm. That's true. They had shut down any anti-state media. Uh, it was all propaganda, but people still were talking and spreading information. And then these informants would go to the state and be like, did you hear? They, they were just saying these things. All right, well, censoring them isn't working. Send them to the gulag. Got to excise them from sight. It was the only way. Because when you, when, when you cut out a man's tongue, you're not proving him wrong. You're only proving you are scared of what he might say. Mm. That's a game of, I'm pretty sure that's a Game of uh, Thrones yeah, quotes. So. Yeah, uh, uh, what's the character? Uh, Tyrion. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. I thought, what you were, I thought you were saying today in your, in your video about ContraPoints was really interesting how, you know, sort of the left is calling out the free speech warriors and the right is calling out the social justice warriors. But realistically, it's... I think that those two things do exist and they're sort of both hypocritical on both sides, but then there are elements of the right and left and center who are more nuanced. And I think that that's where we all hope that we sit, but it's like the, I think that both sides are right to a now, certain degree. Sure. Sure. But you look at the New York times data, they recently did this thing where they said 38% of Democrats are in a bubble surrounded only by Democrats, no exposure to, to conservatives. But it's something like 19% of Republicans are in a bubble with no exposure to Democrats. So that means that there are conservatives who overlap. Uh, conservatives are less likely 
to be in a bubble and not understand Democrats. It makes sense because the, the old saying is that uh, conservatives think liberals are misguided, but liberals think conservatives are evil. To your point, here's what we see. There is a rule when you in the culture war when you look at the left that when a conservative gets censored, they laugh, they gloat, and they celebrate. Then you will see the rule on the right that people will immediately defend the conservatives who get censored. When the leftists get censored, it is a rule that they will scream, it is unfair, it's censorship, and the conservatives are claiming they're the ones getting banned. And it is still a rule that conservatives will defend the left when they get censored. So when the left gets censored, the right and the left scream censorship is wrong. When the right gets censored, the left laughs and mocks the right and the right says this is wrong. You don't think there are elements of the right that laugh when people on the left get banned because they think it's like karma? That's different. Yeah. So it's one thing when the left says, dude, Facebook's a private business. If they want to ban you, they're allowed to. And then a conservative goes, <laughs> you got banned. I thought you said it was a private business. Serves you right. There's a difference. But there are people on the right. That's why I said it's, it's uh, uh the exception on the left are those who would defend a conservative when they're censored. Mm. And the exception on the right is those who would mock the left when they Absolutely. get censored. Absolutely, Yeah, I think that's a good ratio. And then there's the disaffected liberals and moderates who are pretty principled straight through. I mean, the reality is that it's hard to defend free speech in an absolute sense. It's because you're put into a position where you're defending horrible ideas. It's like this burden that you have to carry around. I constantly f feel that, but you have to just keep walking because you, we, we don't have anything other than our principles. But then, you know, I'm not even going to claim to be perfect because there, there are exceptions, you know, there are exceptions, which is the harsh reality, you know, legality, there's legality and then right. there's free speech in the pure philosophical sense. There's law and there's philosophy. It's, it's, it's interesting in that we didn't necessarily have to deal with a lot of the creepy stuff on the internet when it came to public discourse. Like, you know, people would go out in the street and they'd show pictures of like dead fetuses and stuff. And but for the most part, you don't have people walking around with, you know, holding up big signs with like pornography and stuff on it. Now on social media, people can just spam a button and flood a network with garbage and crap. And that, that makes it really difficult for, for regular people to engage in a platform and have this kind of speech when they're drowned out. I suppose in reality, though, the the issue might actually just be anonymity and uh, or, or uh a lack of proximity. Why won't someone show up to City Hall carrying, you know, big posters of, you know, pornography? Uh, because they'd have to be there holding it themselves. And then people would see them and judge them and they'd feel bad and be worried about their access to resources. When it comes to social media, they use a, an a anime avatar or, a, you know, a, a cat person or something. And then they can post whatever they want. No one knows who they are. Right. But the paradox is that when you're anonymous, you feel the true freedom to express what you want to say. Because That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So people post weirdo pictures and creepy nonsense and garbage, and they flood the zone with trash. But so so it's simultaneously the problem, but it's also what gives us free speech. Because when you have anonymity, like, yeah, it causes people to go crazy and like sp spam with like crazy, insane stuff. But it also is like a very important fundamental human right, like arguably. If you have a totalitarian government and you need to, you know, organize uh, a response to it and you, and you if you do it if they know who you are you're dead yeah. but if you have anonymity you can do it functionally yeah like when antifa went out and burned down uh burnt set fire to vehicles and threw bricks through windows and the cops couldn't do anything about it because they were all wearing masks exactly it's true but i was thinking more about the arab spring but yes for good or ill you can yeah. organize safely with anonymity I, i'm into every um, history is written by the victors man do, uh the in, in these countries where they have these revolutions, when the, when the revolution wins, the revolutionaries are the good guys. If they lose, they were insurgent terrorists and they were suppressed. Except for Castro, because we had media now. We have TV and radio, so we can remember how, uh, what was that guy's name? Che Guevara putting the bullet in the guy's head or the girl's head. That image, you ever see that Che Guevara image? We're like, we love Che Guevara. People wear his shirt, a shirt with mm. his face on it. He was a psychotic murder. I mean, he was a murderer. He was he was a cold blooded murderer. But he the Motorcycle murder Diaries children. was a sick movie. I didn't uh -huh. see it. Though. Is that about him? <laughs> yeah, it's actually a good movie. So there are, the history is written by the victors, but maybe the victors were the ones that built the internet. Yeah, but listen.
to, uh, uh, we have history of Shea being a bad person because we aren't socialists, because our, our, our government was anti-socialist. So we made sure that that kind of stuff existed. But history is written by the victors, man. If the activists win, it was, it was funny. What did uh, uh, Jack Posobiec tweeted? Today will be called, like, what did he call it? The age of dumb? Yeah, or the something? age of dumb, yeah. And, I'm, and I said, yeah, but if the left wins, it'll be called the age of new enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It'll be the great awakening, the great awakening, when people finally realized what was truly happening. That's what it'll, that's what it'll be. But and where are the history books? What, what, what are going to be the history CNN. books? You know, I know, but in a thousand years, what are people actually going to reference? What do you mean? Like Wikipedia? That or something more immutable, potentially. Like a blockchain like a or blockchain. databases that can't be tampered with? Right. Or if you see them tampered with, you know they were tampered with? Exactly. I don't, I, I, I disagree. I mean, there will be both. We're going to exist in both worlds. There's going to be encyclopedias on, you know, that are immutable, and then there's going to be ones that are controlled by centralized authorities. Yeah, but the centralized authorities for now control the dominant narrative. It's interesting, though, uh, you know, I like that, that phrase, if the, if, uh, if, if the situation was hopeless, the propaganda wouldn't be yes. necessary. And I mean, uh, um, uh, among my three channels, we get, you know, I think 50 to 60 million views per month. It's down a bit because I used to do three more segments every day. I cut those out and I cut off weekends, but we're still hitting around 50 million. And so it's not the same as, you know, CNN on YouTube gets 200 million. But I think that's pretty good hey relative man, the to YouTube. Net, the net videos over the course of your life because you'll live longer because you're resting a little bit more, you'll, you'll still put out the same amount of content. No, the, the idea is to build something and expand and get other people, you know, empower other people to start doing similar things like this. And so I think there's some optimism there that a show like this can exist. The problem is they've been going after Steven Crowder like crazy. And it's never, it's, it's, it's not for legitimate things. So, you know, Crowder has one of the biggest... I guess we can call it counterculture shows. He is a conservative personality, very funny with millions of fans and subscribers. And uh, he challenges the establishment. He, you know, and, and he questions the official narratives. And so what do they go after him for? Out of context, uh, edgy jokes or just edgy jokes in general, or they just make things up. Like when he was quoting CDC data, they said, oh, that's misinformation. So they take his videos down. And then they boot him from the partner program. So they're trying really hard to, it, it's a culture war, man. How much does it cost to launch a network channel? Do you think? What do you mean? Like in terms of getting channel? like a channel on, you know, TV? I don't know. Um, let me think. I don't think it's that much. Maybe 20 to 50 million. Something for the alternative media to consider. But why do you want to be on TV? I don't know because maybe it's, maybe it's it, not even that much to be honest. Yeah, uh, the, I would be. That's why I'm asking. It, it might not be worth it. But. but I think at this point it's probably dirt because what's the point? Mm. Yeah, but nobody. Well, I, the point is that the, I think there are millions of people who are still in that world. That like the newer generation is not in that world. But you know, I don't know what the numbers are. I think uh, a lot of people are are, are watching digitally. TV ratings are in the gutter, mm -hmm. and we are going to see in the next five to ten years a major switch to to digital. Who controls like getting a channel? On it's 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 the and you you negotiate with the providers. So like you would go to Comcast, mm -hmm. and then say we want our channel to be on your you know list, right. and then you'd work out a deal. And typically how it works is like they give you a, a few cents per household or whatever. So you, it's a lot of money for for some of these channels. Mm. But then you got to produce content. And so a lot of what we're seeing now is, this is amazing. MTV, for instance, they just do reruns of ridiculousness. I love so it. Vice Land or Vice TV or whatever they're calling it these days. Vice was supposed to have their own cable channel and they finally got it. They just started doing reruns of movies. Yep. You'd like turn on Vice and it would be like, you know, Groundhog Day's on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good example of it not being worth it to get a channel because Vice did it and it's not particularly oh. effective. And no one's going <laughs> to yeah, watch it. No one's going to watch it two in the morning or four in the morning. So right. like, what's the point of all that dead space? Well, no, yeah, TV doesn't work. Like, so much like you can't just pull up, you know, go through the channels on your phone. I you would think that they would, the, the providers would start yeah, to do that heck? so that you could just go through the on, channels. <laughs> everything's on demand now. Right. So Hulu is way more uh, um, relevant than cable TV. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if I want to watch Star Trek, I just go to Netflix or Hulu. I right? had an opportunity to do like a radio show. They were like, hey, you want to, let's do this radio show. It's going to air at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. And I was like, okay. So it ran once 
on 8 p- at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, and it was never, you can't get it. It, it was, the, and it felt so like I was robbed. Like I spent all this time recording this thing that is not now persistent on the internet, like as a YouTube video that someone can click on. Mm-hmm. The value of it being there all the time transcends magnitudes more value than waiting wonder, until 9 p.m. to see a show. I wonder if this is all the great filter. You know the great filter? Mm-mm. You know uh, Fermi's Paradox? Vaguely. You're familiar with? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the idea being, you know, if uh, uh, the universe is so vast, then surely there's intelligent life. If there is, how come we haven't seen any signs of it? Yeah. And there's a bunch of hypotheses about why that may be. And the Great Filter is one of them. And that's when a civilization reaches a certain point and they just get filtered out of existence, right? Something happens to intelligent species that they wipe themselves out. And I'm thinking like everything we're looking at right now, um, maybe it's like yeast in a, in, a, in, a, in a bottle, you know, just eating the sugars and farting ourselves to death. But in reference to what you're saying about YouTube and stuff, maybe it's just that we have billions of hours of content every single day, every perspective. And at a certain point, there's just too much static. It's, it's like there was a period where everything was noise. It was chaos. Then we built upon it, this civilization, this order. And then continuing our expansion of technology, it's going back to static, to noise. You know, if you were to actually look at the raw feed of YouTube, like the fire hose of all the videos being uploaded, I bet it's nonsensical gibberish and garbage. It's like a seven second video of like a chicken looking at a camera and then a, a hamster just walking around. Then there's like some little kid staring at the camera confused for three minutes. And then the family, it's just a whole bunch of nonsense no one ever sees. Right, but at this, it's, it's both. I mean, we also have so much access. Like, I feel like I learn faster than I used to. I do. Probably not when I was a baby. Like, you know, you learn the most when you're a baby. But the amount of information that we're getting now is the velocity is so high that we're probably evolving faster in certain ways as well. I think that baby things, uh, uh, I'm not, look, maybe it's true. Like scientists get a baby. I, I recommend it. No, no, hold, hold on. <laughs> how long, how long does it take a baby to start speaking? About a year, a year. And in what way do they start speaking in a year? Just sounds that vaguely resemble in, in, words. I think they say on average in 44 weeks to master a, a, a romance language if you're a Germanic or romantic speaker and 88 weeks to, for an East Asian language like Chinese. Mm-hmm. So in one year, you can be fluent in German or French. A baby can mutter some words. We should do a show, a challenge of like a super smart per- person versus a baby. <laughs> no, I, I Learning think- Learning a language yeah. for a year. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not that, you know, people always say this like, oh, it's so easy to pick up when you're a kid. Well, it's because you're not doing anything. Also, your brain is lit up like they do studies, fMRI exams on people with LSD and their entire brains light up and they're active like the right and the left hemisphere once. And that's how baby brains are. Mm-hmm. They haven't learned well, how to they're trying, filter stuff out. Trying yet, to so learn, they're just as learning well, everything. The dema- the, there's such high demand and need for them to communicate because it's your fir- when it's your first language, like your body is forcing you to figure it out so that you can achieve certain things that you want to achieve, which you don't have that need when you already know one language. That's not true. I mean, depending on where you live, yeah, maybe you yeah. move somewhere and you have to. Exactly, yeah, that's true. And yeah. you'll pick up yeah. the language super Very quick. True, yeah. And so I, I was reading. It says on average, it's 44 weeks. I don't know what the study was. I read it on Reddit or something to master. Uh, if, if you speak a Germanic or Romance language in 44 weeks, you can be fluent in another language. If you are actively pursuing and speaking and using that language, right, you'll well, be fluent. let's launch the study. Well, I mean, I guess the they already show. exist. Dude, I, yeah, how, how, yeah. how long does it take for a child to get to the point where they're having a conversation like this? Probably four years old i mean in four not years like they can be no. discussing discussing the, the nuance of economic policy probably and, the smartest kid in the world i would argue could keep up i think around smartest four-year-old on, on the planet there you go yeah. like uh 10 or 11 maybe they're having a conversation but mostly asking questions due to their lack of exposure to information and context so it's not an issue of ability it's an issue of just time yeah you know we've had more 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 time to to learn things and understand i history. mean there are videos there's one video of this uh Chinese boy playing Chopin uh, fantasy impromptu. He's three. I'm telling you, this it, it's madness. I mean, in, it's probably he's been trained by his parents in a very <laughs> borderline abusive way. I, I don't want to uh, accuse anything, but it's insane. And that's something that none of us could do, and it might take a decade to learn. So, you know, there are, but th- that's the exception. Let's get back to talking about the apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. We're talking how we, about how do we like, um, how do we start talking? Well, about we're talking babies. about yeast farting itself to death in a, <laughs> right. in a in a petri dish, and I think this mass influence of information is causing interference in our under in our ability. So that's the static is this weird 
influence in tide pools what would happen is organisms would live at one level of the tide pool or, uh, vertically so petri dishes are kind of one they're only two dimensional they don't really have up and down you can't really get out of it normally in a tide pool if an area of the tide pool got too acidic or too dangerous for this, these organisms to live they would come together and form a new type of organism that could float up to a different strata of the tide pool and essentially evolve into a new organism collectively they would come together and create huh. a new organism now in petri dishes you don't see that because they're two-dimensional they don't have anywhere to go so they sure. eat them so they die but in the tide pool our nature is to come together form a new species essentially and then move somewhere where we can thrive thanks for checking out this clip from the tim cast irl podcast if you want to see the full show come back to this channel youtube.com slash timcast irl Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. where you can leave comments and super chat, and we actually will read your comments on the show. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and if you want exclusive members-only content segments you can't get anywhere else, go to TimCast.com, become a member, and we even have full bonus episodes. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.